Hi, my name is Khadija Hussain. I'm 30 years old. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2014, been in remission for a year now. Um, the type of cancer that I've got is a very rare cancer. It's only 1%, but did you know that there's 2,000 patients that have been diagnosed in the UK and 8,000 in the US with a huge survi survival rate of 90%? and I think that's a big thing. So come and have a look at my story. Hi, my name is Khadija Hussain. I'm 30 years old. I'm married with two young, beautiful boys. Um, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2014. Khadija, thanks for coming in today. Um, we're here to talk about your cancer story. Yeah. And you've had a Hodgkin's lymphoma, which That's is right. not. Uh, well, it's not uncommon, but we haven't had many people come to Cancer Stories to talk about it. So I'm very interested in um, what happened in your case. Yeah. How did it all start at the beginning? Um, well, basically, um, I spotted a lump on my neck. Um, didn't think anything of it. Um, didn't do anything about it. But then I noticed it started growing a bit. So it wasn't painful, but I went, decided to go to the doctors. I got it checked out that appointment they straight away referred me for scans um, and there the ball was rolling from there okay so it was picked up quite quickly in your case yeah it was yeah i was quite fortunate in that way what was the next step after they referred you in um tests so they started with tests they'd done the um, white blood cell um but then that wasn't 100 percent. so then they'd done the biopsy which confirmed what i had by the time i went to the doctors in july um, by November, I was on treatment, so it was very, very quick. Okay. Um, were the tests fairly straightforward? You know, if you imagine somebody else going through that now, yeah. would they have reason to be nervous or was it fairly easy to tolerate? Um, well, when I had my white blood cell test, I didn't know what to expect because I just thought it was a consultation, but they ended up taking the stems there. It was a bit painful, but it was very quick. And then the biopsy was straightforward. You don't know anything, but the recovery obviously is a little while, depending on where it is, and they're removing your lump. And yeah. What do you remember about them breaking the news to you about what it was? And it's a label that you might not know what it is initially. Yeah. Um, well, the funny thing is, when I actually was diagnosed, my consultant, which I really do actually appreciate, he was quite light-handed. He just said, oh, You've got Hodgkin's lymphoma, shook my hand and said, don't worry, it could have been worse. And that was it. Um, other people probably think that's a bit harsh the way he said it, but I really appreciated that. Um, didn't think anything, walked out of the room, thought, okay, I've got Hodgkin's lymphoma, walked out. But then when I sat in the car, that's when it sunk in and I realized I've got cancer. Because mm. obviously the label that everyone says, cancer, you think the worst, but Luckily with me, I had a whole unit of family who was supporting me, but the drive going home was quite tearful and emotional because I was going home to my two young children. At that time, they were one and two, two boys. So all I could think was, my two boys, I've got cancer, am I going to make it? You don't think of what type of cancer it is and how severe it is, you just think cancer and am I going to survive? Um, so it was quite emotional, it was quite tough. I think I was being strong for everyone else, but once the treatment was going on, I think I realized that, no, I can fight this and I can, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Were you quite determined as a person to get through it? You know, like, were you quite strong going through those initial difficult treatments? Yeah, definitely. I think, I didn't, to be fair, I don't think I even let it sink into me. I, I think I was in denial that I, was, I had cancer and I was going through treatment, I was having chemo. I just took it as each day, I was with my kids, I was with my family. In fact, I was actually comforting other members of family and everybody else who was around me when they said, oh, you've got cancer. I was like, yeah, I'm fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> so it was quite the other way around. So going through it wasn't as bad as I thought, 
but I think the side effects are quite bad and you've just got to handle it um, each day as it comes. Mm. In those early stages, there's uh, a period where you see other patients on the ward. Probably most people go online as well and have a look at material, some yeah. of which is not all positive. Yeah. Did any of that come as a shock to you? Um, yeah, I think I didn't expect what I was going to see. And especially with me, I was put in with a elder group of um, patients who were suffering. So I think that was quite daunting on me because I was the youngest out of all of them. Um, but then when I went online and I started seeing that, oh, they have got a younger group and they were the, like the cancer teen, uh, Teenage Cancer Trust, they were out and they were going here and they had groups, activities. It was more like a um, teenage group that went, they were just together and they were, you know, just having fun and everything. So it was like, you know, you can carry on and you can do things. So it was a positive. Were some of those resources available to you, either in hospital or after discharge? After discharge, I think during there was nothing, I wasn't aware of anything, to be honest, I wasn't, which I think was quite a negative thing. Um, and it just happened when I had a few consultations at the end of my treatment when I was going for checkups. That's when I was aware that, oh, you do know that you've got like, for example, when you're going through everything and when you've completed it and you're in remission, you don't realise you kind of like crash down and you have a breakdown and you think, oh my God, I didn't realize that that was normal. And I had no help at all until I seen the registrar and she said, you do know there's a psychologist who's available. And that's when I thought, okay. And obviously I came, booked myself in and I found out that it is normal to feel how I'm feeling. Mm. That's interesting. Do you think that we should have more resources for people as a standard on the ward? I mean, imagine all these thousands of people going through treatment at this moment yeah. on, in every hospital in every country. Um, of course, it's important they focus on the core medical treatment. Yeah. But I just wonder whether we should provide some emotional and psychological support as a standard. Definitely. I think definitely it should be. I mean, like, as soon as you get diagnosed, you see a nurse and they give you a whole pack of what you can do and when you can't do and how you feel and where you can eat and where you can't eat. That's the standard. I think definitely to put it in there and give them that advice and say, look, anytime we have got this help at hand and is through any stage, it makes a huge difference. Because they do say, yeah, you've got your nurse, your Macmillan nurse, and you can pick up the phone and speak to them. But sometimes you don't want to speak to somebody who's in the clinical side directly through that. Somebody a bit more on the side it, I think it would 100% help, definitely. I'm interested in how people coped on the ward when there's not much stimulation, like you were saying. Yeah. And I know some people really struggle, yeah. uh, but some people maintain quite a positive outlook. What was it like for you? Um, I think with me, I used to, by that time, obviously my hair kind of fell out straight away. So I was straight away wearing my wigs. Um, so I'd go on my treatment, go to the hospital, put my wig on, put my makeup on, my mask on my face, put it on and go straight in, just think of it as a normal day. And um, one of the days that I should remember is actually during Christmas. So I'm sitting in the waiting area, waiting to be seen by my consultant before I had my treatment. Sitting there, I'm singing along to the Christmas carols, the room is surrounded with other patients, elderly patients, and they're looking at me smiling. My husband's with me, he's um, bold and he's next to me. Um, so they're looking at us, they're still happy, smiling. Um, and the, we end up going to the actual chemo suite. Go to the chemo suite and the same patients that were downstairs meet me upstairs. And um, I'm sitting there and I pull my arm out and they didn't expect it. They actually expected my husband to be the one on treatment <laughs> and be the one to actually pulling his arm out. But I pull my arm out waiting for my treatment. And they just look at me, they're like, you're the patient? And I was like, yeah. They're like, you're on high spirits, ain't you? And I was like, yep, yeah, you've got to be. And I think because my hair fell out and I had a wig on and I had my makeup, it made me feel myself again. And I think that's very important because you are inside, you are yourself. So it does, appearance does make a huge difference. But if you can dress it, you're fine. And you do feel a bit conscious that people will look at you and they can see what you're feeling, but they can't, they can't. So it is get up and just be yourself. 
a lot of people struggle with that change in appearance, particularly, you know, when you lose your hair. Yeah. Did it make you feel like you didn't want to go out or you didn't want to see people who might notice that change in you? Yeah, it did. It did totally. I mean, I'd wake up every morning and I didn't want to look into the mirror because I had long, beautiful hair and all of a sudden it was just taken away from me. So I'd look in the mirror, I'd be bold. I didn't shave my head, so I let my hair naturally fall out um, because I thought it'd be more traumatizing shaving it. Um, I let it naturally fall out, which you'd see little bits here and there. I'd, I'd, I wouldn't look into the mirror, but then I turned it around and looked at it and negative as well. I thought, you know what? I don't have to spend hours straightening my hair. I don't have to spend ages in getting ready. All I've got to do is have a shower, put my wig on, put my makeup on, and I'm ready yeah. where other people take ages. So it does make a difference. And how did you feel about the wig that you got? Was it a good match? And was the temperature okay? Did you get used to it pretty quickly? Yeah, I mean, I did with the wig, but then I went out shopping and went to a wig shop and bought quite a few different ones and started experimenting. And I thought you, match. Yeah, I had ones with short hair, I had ones with wigs and stuff that I would never do naturally with my own hair. So I started experimenting and I'd go with wigs that were a different colour and I enjoyed it. I made the most of it. What were people's reaction to you in general during this time? Um, it's quite funny because some people would, wouldn't know how to react, they'd be like, is that a wig or is that your hair? And I'd be like, no, it's a wig. And they didn't actually realise how natural it looks, because you can get wigs out there that do look really natural. So, yeah. And in general though, when you were in that ill period, um, yeah. I'm guessing, you know, you might have looked a little bit different in general. Yeah. What, what, how did you find friends and maybe family responded? Were there, were they generally let's say supportive or you know sometimes friends don't know what to say sometimes yeah. they drift away no i think i had a good close-knit of friends and family so i mean don't get me wrong they did all start acting different with me but not in a bad way they were more sensitive if i was doing something they'll tell me to sit down and relax take a break not to overdo it but obviously within ourselves we want to get up and just do it we don't want to be sitting around and not doing anything um so in that sense they were supportive but at the same time, they did act a bit different. Some couldn't take um, looking at me without my wig because it was quite painful and it's a huge change. It is, we kind of accept it, but then everybody around you, it is, it, it is hard for them to take in. So it was a bit of a mixture. I, de I guess there's a delicate balance when you're unwell about how much people should help. If they help you too much, they do everything. Yeah. And you just become like a patient indefinitely. Yeah. They call that the sick role. Yeah. But if you do, if they don't help you at all, it feels like, hey, I need help. Me. Yeah. That's it. I think it is. It's a mixture because, like you said, they, if they help, they do everything and you feel like you're not capable of doing anything. And then when they don't help and you need help, you don't want to ask. I think for myself, I find it very hard to accept help because. I'm quite independent, like I mentioned, I've got two sons who are young, two and one. Um, my husband was helping 100% all the time, but I was a sole role as a mum, so I had to do everything. So to take a step back, for me, I found it really difficult. I mean, during the Christmas when I was three, four months into my diagnosis, um, I was in the situation where we were in the middle of moving and everything. So my mother-in-law came down from Glasgow and she said, I'll take the kids. She took them for three and a half weeks, just under a month. Sorry. And that was really difficult to accept that my kids are away from me. But I kind of thought, that's it. I feel like I'm neglecting them. But you know what? That was the best thing ever because I needed that time. They needed that time. I was on Skype with them. I was speaking to them. Yes, I got emotional. I cry all the time. But they didn't feel ne neglected. They found it as a holiday. They came back, they were mommy, 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 daddy, 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 they were attached. They were the same. They didn't, I thought that they'll be different, but they didn't. And even me going through my treatment, they were so alert. They were aware, they gave me my space when they wanted to. They were, they didn't, you know, you think your kids will punish you when you're not around them or anything, but they didn't. And that's the most important thing you gotta remember that you, you're not, neglecting your kids you know they won't feel it though they just accept it and they think it's normal because they don't know nothing different mm. 
So if there is a break, uh, the bit that I'm taking from that is you can kind of sell it to them in a positive way. Yeah. In other words, if they continue to do things that they enjoy, but keep in touch with you, yeah. they know that it's not just a, some kind of terrible, ominous event that's happening. Yeah, yeah, that's and it. And when they come back to you, then they just, they've experienced something positive in their life, yeah. but then they're happy to see you again and yeah. you can pick up where you left that's off. That's right, because they just think it's a holiday. They, we... The, us as parents, we think, oh no, we're sending our kids away. But to the kids, because they're attached to all the family members, you know, they're very close to them. So them, it's just a holiday. So and you said something else very interesting there, which is keeping in touch via social media or Skype yeah, in yeah. particular. Um, how much of that plays a part these days? Because you can keep in touch when you're separated from yeah. friends or family a bit more. Like it could happen not just with your kids, but in hospital, let's say somebody's in isolation. Yeah. Obviously, it's pretty safe to yeah. Skype somebody. That's so. it. I think that's a huge thing at the moment. I think it makes a huge difference from not being able to see them and having technology where you can see them. It's a click of a button and you can see them almost like you're there. So you can speak to them directly. It does because you're still connected and you're not because even picking up the phone, you're just speaking to them. You can't see what they're doing and you know, you want to see them, what they're doing physically. They want to see you. So it does make a huge difference. And I think that way is they don't feel as though they're not seeing you mm. and that you're leaving them, if that makes sense. Mm. I mean, it's quite common these days for relatives not be able to make it in if they go to a specialist centre, which is a way away. Yeah. And uh, it's just made me realise that we should be encouraging visits yeah. via Skype as yeah. much as in person. Yeah, definitely. Because um, it just makes that contact more permanent through yeah. a difficult period. No, definitely it does. And it's any time of the day or night, you can just, whenever you want. So it does, it, I think it does definitely make a huge difference. I'd recommend it to everyone. Let's come on to a new thing now, which is about how you tolerated treatment and whether there were any complications. Yeah. Um, how did you get on with the treatment as it, as it unfolded? And how did your body respond? In other words, how successful was it for you? Um, when I first had my first treatment, um, I had ABVD chemo ABVD and when I had that unfortunately my first actual chemo I reacted to it um, they did it via the cannula and I reacted which basically made my nerves um, get damaged and I had, they said that my chemo leaked and I had major nerve pain and I was in hospital straight away but then they said there is a solution to it and it is common and basically they'll put a pick line in your arm which is a permanent cannula which made a huge difference um, I did have side effects. I was in hospital quite a few times, but on whole, the treatment, it did, it was very successful. The thing with my diagnosis was though, they initially said three months of my treatment. So I thought, okay, fine, three months, it'll be over before it's even started. But because of the type of cancer I had and my age, they didn't want to give me radiotherapy. So two treatments into it, they extended my treatment to six months instead of three months. That was quite hard to accept because I was hyped up and like, yes, it'll start and it'll be over before it's even started. But then I thought, okay, you know what? It doesn't matter. Another three months, what would that do? And the positive thing, the positive thing was that it was reacting. So they saw um, results straight away that it was shrinking, which I thought, okay, fine. And by then it'll be gone, hopefully. And yeah, within six months I was cured. During that period, were you coming in to the ward to get your treatment on the chemotherapy suite or did you have to be an inpatient again or what happened? Um, whenever I had my treatment, I was always just coming into the chemo suite. But in between, I was in the um, Osborne building when I was basically I had to ring the line when I was ill or temperatures and I was in for a few nights in and out. But for my actual treatment, I was in the chemo suite. So you had a, you had a few complications in yes, there? Yes, I did. Um, like I said, the chemo when it leaked, um, I had really bad pains in my back. I suffered with gastritis, um, sickness, diarrhea, infections, because obviously our immune system is very low. So just the cold would be a major thing. So I was in and out, which was frustrating. To be honest, it was frustrating. I was fed up. I was like, I'm already going through chemo and then I'm having this. I want to just be normal. and. You do feel down, you do have your very down days, but you gotta realize that every day is a good day and you know what, it does get better. It does, and you will feel like that. 
did you try to keep going because you knew you were doing it for a purpose even though it was hard to tolerate yeah definitely i just kept looking around at my family and my two kids and i thought you know what i have to do this i'm not gonna sit there and feel sorry for myself and say oh this is the end because it's not and i mean generally they've got the researchers have come so far and cancer's dangerous and um a risk as how it was before, like life-threatening as it was before. There's so many cures out there. I mean, like when I was diagnosed, the, the consultant said to me that, you know what, you're lucky. This is the most easiest, common um, cancer you can have, type of cancer you can have. And that was a positive in itself, that yes, I've got cancer, but you know what, it's not as bad, it will get cured. You know, when you were struggling with those really down periods, particularly when you had those uh, maybe infections going on. Yeah. Was there anything you could do to keep going, like in a practical sense? Was perhaps, um, I don't know if the family were even allowed to visit then, but what, what would you say would be little tips that other people could take away as ways to get through those hard times? Yeah, de um, I would, family was definitely allowed to visit. And I think the most important thing is accepting help, accepting to ask for help. Don't feel like you're not able to do anything. and. Because I felt like, no, I have to still carry on. I have to be normal. I have to, because you almost feel like you're not normal when you go through the mm. treatment. That's how I felt like I'm not myself and I wouldn't accept help, but you have to just take a step back, take a rest when you want one, ask for help when you need to and accept everybody around you. There will be families and friends who are distant, but that's only because they don't know how to cope with it themselves and they don't know how to react because at that time, you don't see it, but afterwards you do see that, you know what, everyone around you who saw you, they're suffering as well. It's not just ourselves, it's everybody. So no, take a rest and just accept help. After six months, uh, you'd finished the chemotherapy. Yeah. Um, what were things like when you returned home? I, I'm guessing it wasn't just smooth sailing at that point? No, um, I mean, when I was going during the treatment, I was very upbeat, happy, figured out a routine, and I was comforting everybody else. After the six months, I mentally thought, okay, treatment's over, that's it, it's done. But it was completely opposite. I actually ended up breaking down, having a nervous breakdown, thinking, this is it, what do I do? My moods were all over the place. I was extra irritated. Um, I was aching all over. I felt lonely, I felt lost. I didn't know what to do. I felt like I wasn't capable of doing anything. Um, it just really, really did come crashing down. I, when I used to, I didn't want to go out. I'd sit in the house and I remember there was days where I wouldn't literally, the two, three days I wouldn't even step out the front door. I just shied away and I felt so conscious. Um, I'd go to, the, when I would manage to go out and it'd be a simple thing like just going to the supermarket and doing a bit of shopping. I'd go and I'd be like standing in a queue and I'd feel as though people were looking at me. And I think I'd have to scream out that and explain my story that I went through cancer. That's why I looked the way I did. Even then I was wearing my wig though. I was still wearing my wig that time, but I automatically felt conscious and paranoid. Um, I didn't access no resources. At that time, I didn't know anything was at hand, which again, I think it's important to be told throughout the treatment. Um, I didn't have anybody else to talk to who was going through anything. So all I had was family and friends, which was a help, but it's not what I wanted to hear because all my families and friends were doing that. You know, you've come through the end. Again, the same thing, rest, sit down, rest. You know, you'll be okay. You'll feel like this because you've gone through that. You know, you'd feel a certain way because you've gone through your treatment. But I didn't, I wanted to hear it from somebody in, who's experienced it, which I didn't have. Mm. So it is, it, it is quite hard. It really is quite hard. I think this is a very important observation that you're making that when you're discharged from the acute treatment, yeah. it's not necessarily easy because you're effectively, your body's debilitated by the yeah. treatment. You're yeah. going to recover, but it's in the future. Yeah. And you're basically at the beginning of a rehabilitation program. Yeah, uh, that's process right. Yeah. That is not fully explained. You're sent home and there's this expectation, oh, I must be fine because I'm not coming to the hospital as yeah. frequently. Yeah. But you've still got quite a long way to go at that yeah. point. You're, that left to your own devices, it still could be quite a struggle. Yeah, it definitely is. You automatically think that this is it, right? Treatment's over, 
the worst part's done, that's it. But it's not, the treatment in itself is the easiest part. It's like you just mentioned, the rehab is the hardest and you're on your own. You're absolutely on your own because you don't, no one can tell you how you're gonna feel. No one's gonna tell you what you have to do next. But we, well, me personally, I automatically thought, that's it, I can get back to normal. But you can't, I felt extra tired. I felt more tired than I was going through the treatment. I had to stay in bed longer. My um, muscles started aching me more, so I wasn't able to, just a simple thing like feeding my kids. I wasn't able to do that because my body would ache. Just getting ready, I couldn't do, which I wasn't aware of at all. I thought the hardest part was the treatment, what I was feeling and the aches and pains and the low mood swings was all that. But it's a hundred times worse, I say a hundred times worse afterwards. Now this is where um, hospital services and the voluntary sector needs to step in in a way. Yeah. Now I know hospital services often struggle here because they, all the resources have been put towards acute care yeah and then there's not much left you, you know to look at all this very important area now there are usually voluntary agencies around but you said that you didn't access them is that because you weren't aware of them or i wasn't aware of them hmm. i wasn't aware of anything up until um i actually seen a registrar consultation um consultant when i had one of my appointments and i explained to her that look I'm having a nervous breakdown. I was having awful thoughts in my mind, awful, awful thoughts. And I was explaining to her what I was feeling. And she said to me, you know, this is normal. You've just gone through a huge ordeal. You know, you've recovered something like cancer. You had treatment, it's not something small. And on top of that, I had two young kids who were one and two. That's hard enough in itself to handle, let alone going through my treatment. So she said to me, no, this is normal. And that's when she said to me, you do know that there is these services of seeing a psychologist. So if I hadn't seen a registrar, I don't think I would have been told. Mm. And to be fair, that psycho-oncology service not always available in every hospital in every area. Yeah. We're quite lucky here. Yeah. Um, but most areas do have some kind of um, voluntary organisation. I heard you say in your um, description there that you wanted to hear it from somebody who'd been through it. Yes, that's right. This is a very hot topic now whether we can um, match people up with people who've been through a cancer or a similar journey yeah. and get peer support one-to-one. -one. Yeah. What, what do you think is the uh, value of that? I think it makes a huge difference because, like I said, I had horrible thoughts in my mind and I couldn't explain it to somebody who's not been through it because they wouldn't understand. So if I had the support where I could speak to somebody who ha was going through not even the same type of cancer, but just cancer in itself, who was either recovering, I could speak to them and I'm sure that they'd say the same thing to me, that you know what, we are feeling the same way and I didn't realise that it was a part of your recovery and not just that you're going crazy. Hmm. It does, it, you, I think you, it makes a difference in speaking to somebody who is going through it or just recovered than somebody like, is not being rude but a member of family or a friend, because to them, they're going to just tell you, no, it's okay. You know, you, you'll feel better. Today's a bad day. You'll feel better. But they don't understand what you're going through. They can give you some reassurance. Yeah. But they may not. Not what you want to like. hear. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes you don't want reassurance. No. There's, there's other things. Regarding the peer support model or buddying, as it's sometimes yeah. called, um, some people worry that they might meet a patient who has a different cancer trajectory to them. For example, their cancer is going to be uh, more severe or less severe. Like sometimes seeing somebody else who's struggling more yeah. could be a problem. Do you think that is an issue? Like in terms of matching people together or who you meet? Because I know you meet different people on the chemotherapy screen, yeah. for example. Um, some people naturally form a bond or affiliation and then keep in touch after discharge, don't they? Yeah, I don't think it makes a difference. Um, like I was on the suite when, the chemo when I was having my treatment, there were patients with different types of cancer. Yeah, they were, old, they were a lot older than me, but we all got on and we all spoke and it's funny because our mindsets were at the same level. You know, we saw life in a different way, you, you know, you do things simply and the way how you feel and you're all on the same level. So I don't think it makes a difference in what type of cancer you've got. It's just the buddying to speak to somebody who is going through the same sort of thing 
it makes a huge difference. Mm. So actually it's been about a year now since you stopped treatment, isn't it? Yep, that's right. And um, I know you had these big ups and downs, yep. but what's, what, what's the recovery process been like recently? Um, describe to people how you've managed to get your life back on track. Well, at this point of time in my life, I felt amazing, felt fantastic. Picked myself up, I started going to the gym, um, getting out there, um, obviously doing day-to-day -day activities. Um, again, try, I've actually volunteered to actually be a buddy myself, to speak to patients who are going through the same thing, because I know what it feels like, so... Um, All those things are positive for you. Yeah. Um, were there any things that you couldn't do? Like, you know, you, you'd previously had hobbies that you really loved, yeah. but you found that you just couldn't get back to them. Yeah, that's right. Like, just going out with my friends before I found difficult more because my, I was quite conscious and I was paranoid and then I was quite tired at the same time. But then as time got on, it got better. And now I, I think I'm more the one who organizes things now and say, come on, let's go out, let's go out. And I'm going to the gym. I'm less conscious. I've let, I've, I think the main thing that I was more conscious about was when I stopped wearing my wig mm. and my hair started growing back because for me, my hair was a huge part of my life. It was my identity. Um, so that was more what I was conscious about. But once I let it grow out a bit, and this is what it is like now, this is my actual natural hair. And I've accepted it and I've grown to like it and style it and... So you're implying it's changed from before? Yep. It, what was your style before? Um, my style was long hair, straight hair, and then the wigs were, again, the same long hair. And now it's short hair. And your hair's just grown back naturally a different way in a way? Yeah, it has done. I was worried actually because I was told that your hair could grow back a different colour. Mm. Yes, I've got a few grey hairs which I cover up, but it's grown back the same colour. That's interesting. So you, you, your confidence was helped by your, your natural hair coming back, but yeah. you did the right thing by going out and experimenting when you had wigs. Yeah. Um, so you kind of took advantage of both sides, I guess. Yeah, that's right. I'd actually laugh with other people and say, oh yeah, this is a wig, you lot take ages in getting ready. I don't have to. <laughs> I just have to wake up and put my wig on and that's it. You have to take hours. <laughs> Are there any other ways in general that you've changed as a person from what you were like before the cancer was diagnosed? Yeah, I think I see life a lot more simpler. I take things very easily and lightheartedly. Um, I don't take things seriously. I make the most of my life. I enjoy everything I do. Um, I'm actually at the moment thinking of actually pursuing what I want to do, do and start studying and do a, a course in healthcare. So I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to do it, I can do it, and I'm going to show that I can do it. That's brilliant. Um, so you're really looking towards the future? I am, definitely, yep. I'm guessing the family have kind of recovered as well, in a sense. <laughs> How, how's, that, how's that family life changed for you? Um, well, obviously when I was going through everything, I had my whole family doing everything for me. And at that time, I didn't want them to, and I was more wanting to do it myself. But now, since I've recovered, everyone's just slowed down. They basically let me do everything. My husband, he used to do everything from cooking, cleaning, looking after the kids. I didn't have to do anything. So you had him really well trained. I right? did indeed. And you know what? Looking back, it was amazing. Now, it's opposite. I'm back to doing everything myself and looking after him now. He, he's going he's gonna to hate me for saying this, but now he's kind of like take a step back. And I'll take the mic and I'll turn around and say, I think I should be ill again so you can turn around and do everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it easy now. He has, he has indeed. <laughs> so your roles come back to normal. Anyway. My motherhood, yes, and a wife duties have certainly come back. <laughs> wow, that, that's amazing. So it's been really brilliant hearing your story. I think you've got so many interesting angles to what you've been through. Yeah. You know, the way you cope with those difficult periods and the way you've improved and got your life back. Yeah. And I know, like you say, it felt like you were very much on your own. Yeah. Um, I hope that people will realize there usually are some services around if they do look. Yeah. But I do take the point that once you discharge from hospital, um, there's still quite a way to go and having the support of friends and family can make a really big difference. It can, definitely. And I also think like with the Teenage Cancer Trust where there's um, an age gap 
of the cutovers age of 25. I mean, I was 28 when I was going through it, so I missed it by three years. So I was put in with the elder generation. No offense to them, I mean, they're lovely people, but myself, I felt at that time that I could do so much more and I wanted to be involved with what they were doing but with the cutoff, I couldn't. It's a very good point. In fact, services are often organized around these age cutoffs, yeah. which become a little bit artificial at times. And mm -hmm. if you're just above or below, yeah. you can be a little bit um, awkward in a way. Um, but it would be nice to see services that took the spirit of those teenage cancer trust yeah. type of activities yeah. and applied them to different ages. Yeah, I think that will. Because I mean, when I was looking, I was thinking, I want to be doing that. I could be doing that. But I couldn't, and even if I went to approach them, we still couldn't because of my age. So it was, I think that can help a huge difference as well, going through your treatment, because you've got that extra and you've got that oomph where they'll take you out and push you a little bit and go and doing activities and get out there and not being in the house. Yeah, well maybe clinicians and managers and organisers who are watching this can take <laughs> can get <laughs> They're going to kill improving me. Things. <laughs> start improving things in different areas, not just yeah. here. No, definitely. Katheja, thanks for coming in today. Thank you very much. It's been a much. real pleasure and all the best for the future. Thank you.